Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz, and today we are joined by Blake Rudis. He's going to be presenting The Curve, The Histogram, and Topaz, The Technical Approach. I'm very excited. It's going to be a more technical session and how Topaz can be incorporated with some of those tools. So super excited to see what he has for us today. Let's see here. Let me tell you a little bit more about Blake. Blake is a Photoshop enthusiast with a strong fine art background, from painting in front of the TV with Bob Ross as a child to printmaking and sculpture. He has always had a passion for anything creative. He currently has a thing for HDR photography, and you can see more of his images and Photoshop tutorials at everydayhdr.com. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it on over to Blake. All right. Okay, so first, before we start, I want to say thank you to Nicole and Darcy and everyone at Topaz Labs that does this for us. I know that webinars are a lot of work, and you guys have this down pat, so it's really great that you can bring this platform to us, especially uh, because it allows me to really just let my brain dump on everyone, uh, as I've been traditionally known to do. So we're going to be talking about the curve, the histogram, and luminance values today, and I'm really excited to talk about this because these are three things that are very basic that when you begin to understand how to use these three in your Photoshop or whatever process that you're using, because a lot of these elements are not just in Photoshop, they're even in the Topaz products, and that's what we're going to talk about today, but when you learn these, understand these, uh, the editing process starts to uh, take on less of a what the heck am I doing and um, more of I know exactly what I'm going to do to this photograph even before I shoot it. Um, so this is a really fun topic to, to, to discuss. So anyone who's beginner to advanced, I guarantee you're going to learn something today and if you don't, uh, we'll give you your money back. Okay, so here is the curb, the histogram, and luminance values. These are the three most invaluable building blocks to photo editing, as I discussed before. So what are they? Well, the curve is probably the most powerful editing tool on the planet. Now, I'm not really going to get into this too far now. I'm going to get into that in a second here, but I just want to start that out about the curve. That's why it's number one, first and foremost. I've done some really incredible things with curves, and uh, your whole editing process can really be done with, with curves. So what is the curve? So if you're kind of freaked out about what the curve is, you've seen it before, it looks like math. Um, I like math, so to me it's kind of fun. But when you look at this, you're like, bell curves? Man, I'm done with those. You know, I don't want to deal with a bell curve or this line. It looks like a graph. It's scary. Well, let's break it down. Your darks are going to be everything in that lower left quadrant. Your mids are going to be anything in this middle quadrant, and your lights are anything in, in the upper right quadrant. Uh, so I guess it's actually not a quadrant. It's more like a third, but in that upper right third. And what that means is that if you move this curve in any way, this little line, and make it become a curve, that is going to manipulate your photo accordingly. So let's take a look at this. If you move that up, it's going to make your entire image lighter in that, in that respective section that you move it up in. If you move it down, it's going to make it darker. So what I've done here is I've made a little diagram of what it looks like when you move that curve up and down to make your image lighter and darker. A lot of this is an excerpt from uh, the Digital Zone System course that, that I've created. But looking at this further, you can see that when we move that line up, in the midtones, the entire image here gets really light, kind of washed out. Now let's look when we move that line down, the whole image gets darker. But what happens when we move our darks down and our lights up is that we get this really creative contrast. And what the people will tell you is that this is called the S-curve, and this is like the magical S-curve. And typically, if you have a bad photograph, uh, sometimes this S-curve can be just the trick to get you right on that path, is just make that really small S-curve. And actually, in a lot of my editing, I will make an S-curve to make those darks darker and those lights lighter. It's kind of like the concept of dodging and burning, but almost automatic by bringing out those lights and those darks by putting them in their respective areas. This can also be done for color. So if you're in the RGB channel, in the RGB channel, it'll make your image lighter or darker. But if you go into the red channel, RGB combined is typically going to be the luminance or the lights and darks in that photo. But if you go into the red channel and you move it up, it's going to make your image more red. If you move it down, it's going to make it more cyan. If you move it up, it's going to make it more green in the green channel. If it down, it's going to make it more magenta in the green channel. Because these are what's the, the, the um, complementary color system here, is that the opposite of green is going to be magenta. So if you take away green, you're essentially adding magenta. And then blue, the opposite of blue is yellow. Now, 
typically in painting, blue is going to be orange, but in the whole digital world, it's a little bit different. And these are also excerpts from the color zone system here. A lot of the stuff that I teach in the color zone system, I'm pulling from that to show you here. So what is the histogram and the luminance values then? Well, the histogram is really just like this representation of luminance values in the pixels of your photograph. So you have to think of these, of the histogram as each individual piece of that is a slice or a plot. So for every amount of pixels that are in your photograph, they get plotted on this chart, this bar graph. And this bar graph has 255 total plots that those pixels can be in. So we'll break that down here. Zero is going to be black and 255 is going to be pure white. So pure black is, is zero and 255 is pure white. Now I'll get into this even more when we start to look at our photographs. But the cool thing here is that while the uh, the movie theater has uh, 50 shades of gray, we've got 254. So we're a little bit crazier here. So if we look at the pixel values here, this actual spot on this histogram right here is a pixel value of 31. So that would be a very dark pixel. If we look here, here's zero, here's 255. They're in that respective area. There are that many pixels that create that 31 area. And then here we've got 96. There are that many pixels that create that 96 block and then the 150 and then the 240. So each one of these little pieces that you see here, these jagged edges, it's not because our computer can't render a nice clean curve. It's because uh, they actually don't belong that way. They're actually supposed to look pixelated because they are points on a graph. Okay, so here let's look at a photograph that is really washed out. If we look at this and we look at the histogram here, you can see that there really is no white in this entire photograph and there really is no true black in this entire photograph. So as we look at that and we move those over, it, we go from 255 to 214. So the, when we move that down, that's where pure white rests in that 214 block. So in order to bring out the uh, the white in this photograph, we had to go all the way down to 214. And the same is true on the other side. In order to bring out some pure black, we had to go to 38. Now, this gets into the whole uh, overexposure and underexposure kind of category. You can have something that is off the chart. So if you have something that's off the chart, overexposed, you have entirely too much white here to the point that you've gone beyond white, and all of this area is blown out, which you probably heard that phrase before. It's off the chart. It's off our histogram chart. And the same is true here for our blacks. Everything down here and over here to the left is all pretty much clipped black areas. There's way too much black here. It's a very um, underexposed photograph. So now what makes this curve so special? Well, what makes the curve so special is that it does all three. It's the curve, it's the histogram, and it's the luminance value. All of this information can be found in there. The curve, that's the area that you edit for your, for your tone, and then the histogram is contained right there in the curve, and then you have your luminance values at the bottom. Now, typically with Photoshop, you're going to see this the most uh, in, in this way. Okay, so now let's get into the fun stuff. Let's... Uh, go into Photoshop and look at some pictures. Okay, so I just recently went to Oregon and was going there to shoot a long exposure photography course that I'm probably not going to be able to put together for a very long time, but um, I didn't get a whole lot of time to shoot there, but the, the areas that I did shoot were absolutely breathtaking and gorgeous. And this image that you're seeing right here is a seven exposure HDR photograph that has been brought into Photomatix and I used the contrast optimizer to just put all those exposures on the same level because there was a lot going on in this image. So what I mean by why the curve is so powerful is we can look at this image, we can open up a new curves adjustment layer and we can see a lot of things on our curve. So in Photoshop, if I press Alt or Option on the black area over here on the left, you see the spots over here in this corner right here that start to show up as pure black. That is pure black. That is where pure black exists in this photograph to the point that those are actually clipped black areas. And it's okay to have clipped black areas. I'm going to say it's okay to have clipped black areas because that it, it, it doesn't really detract from the photograph. What you don't want is something like this where those areas of, of pure black become really big splotches of pure black. That would not look very good in print. And the same is true with our whites. So if we have any clipping in our whites, like you see there, when I press Alt or Option and click on that little uh, handle there, that's going to show me areas that are blowing out or that are clipping in the white section. Again, 
clipping in your highlights does happen in reality. If you look at a cloud that the sun is behind, it's going to appear really white. So, you know, sometimes people will tell you don't clip your shadows, don't clip your highlights. Well, sometimes clipping does a, a it does happen in, in nature, so we can allow that to happen. So the curve can tell us a lot about a photograph, especially if we apply that curve with a gradient map. Because that gradient map, when I create that gradient map, I go down here where it says gradient map, and if this creates a, a different color, let's say it's something like this, it's because the colors in your palette were not black and white. If you just click on that gradient map and go here, it'll make your image black and white. The reason why I look at my photographs in black and white is because the black and white shows me uh, where my image might be missing contrast. So when we look at it this way, it, it does appear like we are uh, missing some contrast here. There is some black, then there is some pure white, but our midtones are missing. So let's go ahead and jump into Clarity. I'm going to press Control J to duplicate this, and I'll just call this Clarity. So we go to Filter. Topaz Labs and Clarity. Now, a lot of people ask me, what is your favorite uh, plugin for uh, from Topaz? And it's Clarity, uh, hands down. I, I love Clarity. Now, I like what Impression and Glow can do too, but Clarity is a for me. I'm a very technical oriented person, and Clarity allows me to do things with my photographs that uh, a lot of the other programs don't do. And especially for being an HDR guy, I absolutely love it. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit here, so we can see this a little bit better. So in looking at anything, when I'm working in any product or plugin, I always look at the histogram because that histogram is going to show me a lot about my photograph. So I'll click on the histogram over here, and that I don't really need the navigator panel. I know what I'm looking at. So we'll go to the histogram, and when we use the histogram in our editing, it'll tell us uh, what we're doing right or what we're doing wrong in that photograph. Now. This is a technical approach. It's one of those things that uh, there is no right, there is no wrong. For the most part, there is no right and there is no wrong in what you do in, in art editing. But this will tell us if we're blowing our highlights or we're clipping our shadows too much. Because as I move any of these sliders, you'll see that as I move any of these contrast sliders, it's affecting my histogram, right? So as I move this over, it's reallocating different pixels into different lines. So we looked at those lines before. As I move this to the left, it's going to make it, uh, it's going to, well with, with the contrast here, it's going to actually kind of create like a wash if I move it to the left and not really give me any more detail in those areas. It, it almost has like a diffused look to it, which is actually kind of nice for some photographs. I'm not going to use it for this one though. But in these micro contrast areas, this allows me to go into the very minute areas of contrast in my photograph, the very small areas of contrast in my photograph and, and bring them out or smooth them over. So with this, I'm actually going to bring it to the right just a little bit. And uh, that looks about good right there. And then the low contrast, that's going to give me a little bit bigger selection of contrast in my image. It's not quite that micro area, but as I move that up and move that down, you can see what it's doing to my histogram. You see, as I move this all the way over to the right, it's really flattening down that histogram, and it's pushing my blacks way to the left and my whites way to the right and reallocating the pixels accordingly. And I, I don't like the way that looks. I'm just showing you what happens with the histogram, how we can make that, that uh, educated uh, decision with the, the sliders here. So I'm going to move that to about the 0 0.9 range, 0 0.11, 0 0.9 range is good. And then we have the, the medium contrast. Same thing. As these areas of contrast, as you move them up and down, you notice that these areas of contrast get larger and larger and larger. The micro contrast was very small selections, whereas the low contrast was slightly larger, and the medium contrast gets larger and larger until we get into the high contrast sections. And, but see, as I make these edits, always be aware of what's happening to the histogram. Okay, so I'm going to move that down just a little bit because I don't want those edits there. The medium contrast, I'm just going to bump up just a little bit too. And then the high contrast, let's move that up and see what happens. Okay, I like what happens with the high contrast here, what it's doing to these rocks here, so I'll go ahead and leave that. This is kind of a, um, this process of looking at the photograph is, is twofold. You've got the histogram up here that tells you what's happening, but then you also have your artistic eye and your artistic vision that tells you what you should be doing with this photograph. So as we move down, we have the tone for the black levels, the mid-tones, and the white levels. So if we move the black level up, 
it's going to push our image further and further away from those black levels, reallocating those pixels further to the right. And if we move that black level to the left, it's going to reallocate our pixels so that we get that really dark image to the left. So that is a much more uh, fast movement than what you have up in the here in these micro contrast details. So these micro contrast and the, and the low contrast and the high contrast, the dynamics here, these are smaller adjustments for those that contrast area, whereas these will boost your contrast much quicker and much faster. So let's see, let's just move this down just a little bit and make those black levels just a little bit darker. And then we'll look at our midtones. And it looks like our midtones could use a little bump up, not too much. If I bump up those midtones, you see we get farther to the right with our midtones and farther to the left with our midtones. It's like picking up the midtones in the middle and just throwing them to the left or throwing them to the right. Which here it actually makes kind of a dynamic looking photograph, um, but I'm not really going for an artistic effect now. I'm going for more of a uh, clean, refined edit for this photograph. So we'll go ahead and take the white level and we will bring the white level up just a little bit more too, and that looks about good. So here's the original and here's the processed. It looks so subtle, but it's, it's a very powerful adjustment. If we look right here within these rock areas, uh, you can see there's a lot more contrast within those rocks. A lot of our details are pushed forward a little bit. And this is different than Topaz Detail uh, because Detail will really pull those details out even more. This is more of just a refined workflow area. What I also like about clarity is what it allows me to do with the hue, saturation, and lightness. Uh, now, if uh, you follow me in uh, Everyday HDR, HDR Insider, I always talk about tone and color, tone and color, tone and color. And what does clarity do? It does tone and color. That's what I love about Topaz Clarity. It targets two of the most powerful things to get a refined. We aren't looking at artistic stuff here. This is really just refining the image to make the image better. Okay, so if you remember, this image was taken straight out of Photomatix. It was an HDR washed out, 50% gray looking photo, low contrast. And now we get to add that contrast back into it. So let's look at our hue saturation for these individual colors. So hue, the basic idea behind hue is that hue will take a certain color and rotate it a uh, certain degree around the color wheel. So if we move it left, it's going to take all of our reds and rotate them left around the color wheel a certain amount of degrees. It looks like these are only moving about 30 degrees around the color wheel. Saturation, that will increase the saturation of a color. If we move the saturation all the way up in like the yellows and the greens, that will make our uh, image look like, um, I guess, circus vomit, so we aren't going to do that. But the idea behind saturation is that saturation adds potency to the colors that exist there. And the luminance of a color makes that, that color lighter or darker. So imagine you have a color on a color palette and you add white to it to make it lighter or black to it to make it darker. So looking at this, this is a little bit different than what we were talking about with the curve and the histogram and luminance because it's not really going to show us too much about the curve, histogram, and luminance, but what it does do is it helps us refine our color. So before we move into Topaz Adjust and move on, I want to talk about color here for a second. So looking at this, what I like to do is usually go into saturation first and bump up the saturation in that respective color because I could sit here all day long and move the hue and the luminance of the color red, but guess what? It doesn't really look like there's a whole lot of red in this photo, so I'd be wasting my time. So I'm not going to move red at all. I'll just leave that at zero. Now orange, if I bump up orange, orange does exist in this photograph. It looks like there's quite a bit of orange that's resting on the water and some orange here on the rocks and in the grass. So I know that there's some orange here, so do I need to amp up the saturation in the orange? Uh, probably not a whole lot. It doesn't look like I need to, so I'll just go give it a little bit of a boost, not a whole lot. Same thing for yellow. Do I have yellow? Yep, I have yellow in the grass. Typically you're going to find yellow in your grass um, and not necessarily green in your grass, and you'll see that. So sometimes the grass isn't always greener on the other side. It just might be a little bit more yellow. Uh, you know, but I'm okay. So moving on to green, um, let's see if there's any green here. We'll bump up the saturation. It doesn't really look like there's a whole lot of green within that grass, but we'll move it down a little bit to make uh, to pull some of that green saturation away. As we move the yellow saturation up, sometimes it's a good strategy to move the green saturation down so that they kind of play off of each other because there's less green in that green area than in the grass and there is yellow. It doesn't look like there's going to be any aqua in here, but we'll look. No aqua. And then blue. Blue is going to be in our sky. So the sky definitely wasn't that blue. It had just gotten done raining um, the whole time I was there. That was not very fun. So I'm going to move that down just a little bit, just the negative 0.0203 area. 
And then purple, magenta, there's really usually not going to be a whole lot of purple or magenta in your image unless there's like a raging sunset or sunrise. So when we go into the hue, this is where we get to change the color of our color. So if we, and we already know that there's no real red there, so let's look at our orange. Do we want to make our orange more yellow or do we want to make it more red-orange? Well, it looks like it might benefit from a little bit more yellow being bumped over to the right, so we'll do that. And looking at our yellows, well, if we change that, we move that over to the, the right just a little bit, we get a little bit more green grass there. And typically when we look at a photograph, even though the grass may not be super green, the thing is if you add a little bit more of that green to that yellow, it boosts up and kind of punches out that yellow a little bit more and makes it more of an attractive green rather than uh, a dull mottled uh, grass look. You know, So we'll bump that up just a little bit. And then the greens, um, well, let's see here. We can take some of that saturation out, make those greens just a little bit more yellow to make that a little bit more realistic. And with aqua, we didn't really have any aqua in there anyway. And then let's look at blue. I can change the saturation in that blue and make that just a little bit more on the blue side moving over to the magenta. And then the luminance. So the luminance, like I said, add white to it, it's going to make it a little bit whiter. Add black to it, it's going to make it a little bit darker. Uh, it looks like the luminance, uh, we didn't really have a whole lot going on with red, so I'm not going to move red. And then orange. Bring that down just a little bit to make those orange areas a little bit darker because it looks like the foreground is kind of taking away from our vision of the photograph. So I'm going to move that down just a little bit. And then the yellows, we'll make those a little bit darker too. We'll move those down and make the yellows a little bit darker to kind of make that more subtle because I really want the eye to be attracted to the beach or, and the waves. And typically our eye is going to be more attracted to areas that are more sharp, that are uh, more saturated and that are, have a lot of highlights in them. That's the first place our eye is going to go. So if I leave this up here, our eye is going to get stuck here before it goes into the water, so I'm going to move that down. Looking at the greens, um, I don't think I'm going to change the luminance of the greens too much. There wasn't any aqua in here, so let's look at the blue. And I'm going to make that sky just a little bit darker. Okay, so that looks about good. So let's bring this into Photoshop and see with that curve and that uh, gradient map, just what happened here. So I added a gradient map up here to make that black and white to get a nice black and white looking photograph and when I remove the eyeball from the clarity you can see that our black and white image has become a lot better. So now let's put a curve on here and see what areas are black and white now. So it looks like we haven't gone too far in clipping our blacks any more than we did before and our whites have actually have less clipping than they did before and we can see that by taking the clarity off pressing Alt or Option here, and you see with the clarity off, that original image had a lot of more, a lot more blowouts in our highlight areas, but with that clarity on, there's a lot less blowouts in those highlight areas. All right, so now let's go ahead and go into Adjust and just kind of bump everything up just a little bit more. Um, I'm going to press Control shift Alt and E, and that's going to create a stamp of everything I did below, and we'll just call this Topaz Adjust. Adjust was the very first Topaz product that I bought, and I fell in love with it. I played with it for like at least uh, five hours within the first day that I bought it. Um, and I still do like what it can do. Uh, as far as artistic-wise, this is where you start to get more on the art artistic level. Um, you can do some technical stuff with, with Adjust, but typically what I use Adjust for is um, really kind of making everything look a little bit more maybe grungier or adding a certain effect to it. Um, that's what I like Adjust for. So with Adjust, uh, the adaptive exposure, the way the exposure works here is that as you move the adaptive exposure up, it moves up based on the amount of regions that you have below. So here, if you can imagine this being divided into four pieces, that would be four different regions. And as we move this up, you can see that that effect gets more and more drastic because now we've taken those four regions and turned them into 48 regions. So it spreads it out over the entire photograph even more. So that, what I always do, if you see me do this stuff in, in a lot of my tutorials, is I'll, I'll really bring the effect way up so I know what that effect is doing, and then I'll taper it down until my eye sees something that it likes. And that's 
typically how I operate 90% of the time in the stuff that I'm doing. So I'm just going to bring that adaptive exposure down just a little bit more. And then let's go ahead and bring up our regions. So we'll bring those regions up pretty high so that the adaptive exposure is uh, sp spanning itself over the entire photograph a bit more. Okay. So now let's go ahead and go into the contrast, bump up the contrast a little bit more. And that's about right there. And we'll leave brightness alone because I don't want to mess with that. I did a lot of that in the last. But what we can see here is that even those subtle effects added some haze to our, our uh, sky back here that kind of brings that back, those little clouds back there. I'm not going to add any detail or noise or color to this, but what I do want to do is look at the curve because we have a curve right here within uh, Topaz Adjust. And with that curve, we can just go ahead and move this down just a slight bit make our dark slightly light darker and our lights slightly lighter by making that S curve. So you can see that that just kind of ramped up this whole thing a little bit more. A lot of people may not have Photoshop, but they have uh, Topaz products and want to know where that curve is. Well, here you can find it in Topaz Adjust. You can manipulate that curve amongst other Topaz uh, products. And we'll just go ahead and press OK at this point. I don't need to do anything else with that. So now, again, let's go ahead and put that gradient map on and see what the difference was by adding that topaz adjust layer. So by adding that topaz adjust layer, I made my lights a little bit lighter. I'm making a much more compelling black and white photograph. And if we can see from where we started by pressing alt or option on the background layer, it was very gray, went into clarity, and we went into topaz. So now this is at the point where I would almost say that this is probably done. But what I would like to do now is do some more artistic effects. So I've got my tone, I've got my color, I've got all my contrast in the areas that I want, and I almost, I almost have this scene to the point that it looked like with my eyes when I was there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Topaz Restyle. And if I press Control, Shift, Alt, and E and make a duplicate copy of this, what I want to do is show you how Restyle is working. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make this a black and white layer by pressing Control, Shift, and U. That will desaturate this layer. So this is just a black and white layer. And I'm going to go to Image, I'm going to go to Adjustments, and I'm going to go to Posterize. And I'm going to posterize this by six different levels. Because a lot of people, when they jump into Restyle, they see all these colors and they immediately jump out because they're like, what the heck is this? Okay, so we've got it broken down into six different levels of color here. So if I go into Topaz Labs and I go to Restyle, you'll see that in Restyle, when I add a certain color to this, the look at the color scheme that we see on the left and now look at the image on the right. You see how each one of these areas, or I guess if you want to call them regions, the primary, secondary, third, fourth, and fifth, you can actually see where these colors are being applied a lot easier when the image is broken down onto a level where there's only six different planes. It's posterized. So basically what a posterized does is it takes your image and it will put it into as many layers as you want. When I used to screen print in my old printmaking days, uh, what I would do is I would uh, posterize a lot of my screen printing so that when uh, when I was doing my layer work, I could create a whole sheet of color and then just add those posterized layers on top of it. Much more labor intensive than what we have here in Photoshop. But looking at this, it's a lot less intimidating when you know exactly what's going to happen to your photograph in those areas that it's going to happen. So for this one, I want to use this pumpkin pumpkin sheen. I like this kind of color that it's got going on here. And I'm going to jump out of here and do this on the actual photo, but I just wanted to show you just how this breakdown is. So when you go in here, you have your hue, your saturation, and your luminance, just like we saw in Clarity, the hue, saturation, and luminance working on those individual areas in the photograph. So let me go ahead and jump out of here. I'll make that stamp again. Control, Shift, Alt, and E. Always do things on a new layer. Go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and go to Restyle. So now that I'm back here in Restyle, you can see that things look a little bit different, how that overall color is being cast on the, the image. Okay, So there are two different ways that I work with Restyle. And one of the ways that I work with Restyle, it's to color grade an image like I'm showing you here. And the way I do that is I go to Soft Light. I go up here to the Blending Options, and I change that to Soft Light. And I start out at 0%. And I slowly work my way forward until all of the colors in my image start to kind of take on a presence from the color that I'm given from that 
uh, that look. Now, I with this image, I picked something that was more on the yellows and orange levels to kind of bring out the sun hitting along the beach like that. So uh, the other way that I work with it is I go to luminosity, and this is a lot more fun. So when you go to luminosity, now what you're telling photo or what you're telling restyle is that you don't want restyle to affect the color in the image, you only want it to affect the luminance in the image. So if I bring this all the way up to 100% and then go to the luminance of each one of these different areas, watch what happens as I move this up. Now I can make my lights a lot lighter in that one respective area and then I can look at all the different colors and kind of make those lighter and darker as I go through. And this is in the luminance because what luminance is doing is it's adding a little bit more white as we move it to the right or a little bit more black as we move it to the left to those individual areas. And this is a really fun way to work with restyle. So you can see the before and the after. We have a, a, an even more refined image now. And what we'll do is we'll open this up in Photoshop and exactly that we're going to go into our uh, gradient map and see just what we've done with our photo. So let's turn all the Topaz stuff off. We went into Clarity, we went into Adjust, and we went into Restyle. We really started refining this image working with those principles. Now, the, the principles behind Restyle is that the areas that it's targeting are your luminance values. Each one of those areas, those five areas, is targeting different luminance values within your photograph. So now I want to get into glow and impression to show you uh, kind of how, how much more fun we can have with this. So we talked about the curve a lot, we've talked about the histogram a lot, and now we're going to talk about how we can use the luminance values in our image to make some really awesome stuff with glow and impression. So here's the after and here's the before. If you look at this, it looks like I used restyle, but it also looks like I have elements from the image before. And the, it, it's really a lot easier than it looks. I didn't use masking, I used uh, some really cool features in Photoshop. So this is going to be very Photoshop specific, but it's going to be all about understanding those luminance values in our, in our pixels. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press Command or Control J to duplicate that background layer. First I'm going to go into Topaz Labs and go to Glow, and I'm going to glow this image up. And the, thing, the way I use Glow is actually in a very subtle way. If you've seen any tutorials I've done on YouTube. Um, I like to use Glow to create this uh, glowing effect in the photograph. Now, if you look at a lot of these presets, you can see that they do some really interesting stuff to your photograph, and it's probably stuff that I would never do to my photograph by themselves. But when you start using the blending options, with, whether they're in Photoshop or right here in Glow, you get some really compelling effects. So one of my favorite ones here in Glow is this one called Radiate. It's right here if you go up to the presets and you go to Afterglow and you click Radiate. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to open this up and that's all I'm going to do. So now what I want to do is I want to change this to um, Soft Light. And you can see what that did was it just kind of really amplified my colors and my uh, lights and my darks and gave me like this diffused, almost dreamy looking effect. And you can further enhance that by pressing Control shift u Now, by pressing Control shift u I desaturate that layer. So now that layer is only affecting the blacks and the whites in my photograph. And it creates this really uh, kind of interesting glow effect. It makes my, my lights pop and it makes my darks really dark. But one thing that I don't like that it's doing is it makes, it's making these lights really, or these darks down here really dark. Now, what I could do is add a mask, but there's a better way to do it. So if I double click right here, this is going to bring me into what's called the layer style or uh, layer options. And right down here you see something called blend if. Now you can blend if gray, red, green, or blue. So if I blend if and I look at the underlying layer, a lot of times people are like, blend if, what the heck does that mean? Well just think about it this way. What do I want to protect in this image? What do I want to protect in the underlying layer? Well in this one I already talked about, I want to protect my black areas in the photograph. So if I move this to the right, you start to see right down in here in particular, watch, let me go ahead and uh, zoom into there and show you that real quick. And I'll go back into the blend if. So if I move the blend if over, you can see that it, it, it's protecting my blacks, but it's doing it in a very pixelated way. And the reason why is because look right here, these are luminance values, 0 to 255. So I want to protect anything that's black, but as I move it over, it's actually 
selecting that pixel value. So it's saying pixel value number 23, protect anything from 0 to 23 in that pixel value of 23. So it really kind of looks uh, pixelated. But what this really cool thing that Photoshop does, if you ever have an idea and you're not sure it's going to work, press Alt or Control or Option or Command or Shift or put all your fingers on the keyboard and then just do it. So right here, if you press Alt or Option and you click on this slider and move it, it will split it. And when it splits it, it's protecting it with a graduated type of filter. So now it's a nice, clean protection. So I'm just going to do that to those black areas. And if we look at the before and after in our history, look at how much that actually saved in that area. Now, it gets better. This is a really cool magic trick. And if you don't think this is the coolest, then uh, I don't know. You can log off. I'm just joking. Don't do that. So I went ahead and made a stamp, Control-Shift-Alt-E. I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and go to Impression. So now when I open Impression, one of the things that I love about Impression being a former painter is that I can do a lot of really cool painterly things with Impression. But sometimes it just looks like I used a filter. You know, like you, you just apply a filter and you're done. And you can do masking or you can do something uh, even cooler. So I'm going to go into the painting area here. And I'm going to select the preset by this uh, guy named Blake. It says Oil Glaze by Blake Rudis. This is one of my favorites. I love this preset. So I'm going to go ahead and open this. And what it does is uh, it gives me a nice kind of wash. It still protects some of the, the detail underneath. You can see some of these pits of color that are still protected underneath. But let's go into the Blend If options. And let's go to the underlying layer and protect anything dark. So now you can see all of the dark details from 0 to 128. So basically what I'm saying is anything from black to mid-gray give me a nice graduated protection. Don't let those areas be affected by what I just did in impression. And I can do that with my whites too. So up here in the clouds, you see how there's all these paint strokes in the clouds? Well, if I can protect those too. Look at that. Now those, paint, now those painted areas are nice and protected. And it goes even further. You can do this for your reds, greens, and your blues. So if I go into the blues here, because I have some blue sky in the background, I can protect the blue sky in the underlying layer and make that show through. Or if you see the blend if, this layer, if anything in this layer is blue, go ahead and remove that. So I don't want anything in this blue layer. I'm pressing Alt or Option to split these. And it gives me a nice, clean blend. So what you're looking at here, it's really kind of crazy. You're like, wait, is that a photograph or is that a painting? And you're really, really fooling the eye. So now I'm really going to drive this home with another photograph. And these are, these are all from my trip to Oregon. This was Cannon Beach. This is Haystack Rock. It's like a 243-foot rock. It is absolutely breathtaking when you see it. It, just, it really does take your breath away. And then here, the crazy thing about Oregon is that you'll be walking through a rainforest, and then the next minute you're on a beach. It, it was crazy. I'm, I'm at this place called Short Sands Beach, and here I walk through this rainforest, and then after I go through this trail that's over here and walk for about a half a mile, you're on the beach. So what I've done here is, let's go to the very beginning. You can see I went through my digital zone system, I went through my color zone system, and then I used one of my favorite things that uh, I just gave to the HDR insiders. It's called a custom radiance uh, action, and then I did some dodging and burning. And then I did those two things with Topaz Restyle, or Topaz uh, Impression and Topaz Glow to create this painted look. But again, this might be too painterly. So what I can do here is I can add a mask, and then I can just start to paint in on this with black on those areas to bring out some of the uh, underlying image. So you're really full in the eye. And I do this a lot now. Um, I'll use glow and impression together to create a um, kind of surreal effect in the entire photo. But then I'll bring certain areas back. Like I'll bring this area under here back. Maybe some of these uh, ferns over here. Maybe this little area over here. Maybe this area that's most present in the foreground at the top. I'll bring that back. But then I'll leave the background painted. And it kind of gives us this uh, really... Uh, interesting looking effect that's more interesting than this. Everything's in focus, everything's clean, but then this gives it like an artistic, um, it really makes it feel like uh, like what I saw when I was there. And it's one of those things that the minute I took this picture, I said, this is going to look great in impression with this impression and glow. And what I did was I used, uh, I, used uh, I believe I used impression first on this one. And if you look at the blend if options, I just used all those blend if options that I did before by pull, pushing and pulling those areas of, uh, of 
color by protecting those areas using those luminance values. So the curve, the histogram, and luminance values, when you begin to understand them, I know it's a lot of information to take in, but break them up. Um, do some research on them. Look at curves. See what curves can do for you. Don't get intimidated by them because it looks like math. And the histogram, it's nothing more than a bar graph telling you where your pixels are. That's it. And where you reallocate those pixels as you edit. So just make sure that you keep in mind that if you push it too far to the right, you're going to be clipping those areas and putting all of your pixels into the white area, which is going to make it look gross. And the same thing on the black side. So you want a nice good spread. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have clipped highlights or clipped shadows. It's okay to have black and white in your photograph. Actually, it's good because your eye, as the viewer's eye navigates the photo, they're going to have a resting point on those black and white areas. So that's actually a good thing to keep in your photographs. And then the last part is the luminance values. I just started using these blend if options recently and did uh, two tutorials um, on YouTube with these recently. And I've just been blown away with what I've been able to create with it because I'm doing a lot less masking now and a lot more intuitive editing. And if I say I want those whites protected, I know that I want a certain value of light and dark protected. It's a very cool thing to, uh, to start to understand. This has been awesome. That was a ton of great info, and we're having some really great uh, positive feedback about I even all tried of to this slow down this time. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Blake, again. This has been great. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day, morning, or afternoon. We'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye.